Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 167. I'm speaking with Rory McGregor, the CEO of Perspective, the creators of Cinesync and other products. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Have you ever sent in your reel wondering why you didn't get the call back or what was the reason you didn't get the job? Here's the thing. Most of us think you just put your latest work on your reel to some cool music and send it off and then you get the job. A lot of us aren't aware that the majority of the reels sent to studios are skipped through and sometimes never even watched in the first place. The fact is everything we're taught about landing a job as an artist is wrong. Over the past 20 years working for studios like Industrial Light and Magic, Ubisoft, Blur Studio, I built hundreds of teams hired thousands of artists and reviewed tens of thousands of reels. That's why I decided to write a book from the perspective of somebody that actually does the hiring. Learn the exact formula to captivate and qualify you as the obvious artist for the job. How to build a reel that ranks high on YouTube and attracts studios to you. The best part is with this book, you can get it right now absolutely free. Whether you're in design, games, TV, or film, go over to alanmckay.com slash myreel. Okay, so welcome to episode 167. This is a fun episode. I got to sit down with the CEO of the product Cinesync, as well as the company Perspective, and just discuss this product, this platform in depth about the history of it and its relevance inside of the movie industry. So for anyone not familiar with Cinesync, it's pretty much the backbone of how directors, supervisors, studios, everyone in the film industry and a lot of surrounding industries now, I believe games and other places too, are all able to communicate. So I thought this would be a fun one to chat about since everybody uses CineSync. I love that ILM that they would actually record the CineSync session so you wouldn't be typically sitting down with the director, but you could actually sit down and get the feedback kind of be the fly on the wall in the room while the supervisor talks with the director. So it's always kind of fun to watch that. Uh, it's also fun if you're um, ever working on Michael Bay or James Cameron projects and they have CineSync sessions and you watch through it and you're like, you know, a bit of the video was blacked out and like none of my stuff got reviewed. So I guess when <laughs> certain directors like those two hotheads um, tend to really badmouth everyone, they would um, black that whole section out. So that way it would keep morale up because the artist wouldn't get to hear all the bad stuff the director said. What is this? You'll never work in this town again. So CineSync is used by everyone. It's really cool just to kind of sit down and talk with Rory about this product that is pretty much the glue of the industry. So one last thing I wanted to mention, the audio in this isn't the best. It's pretty good, but there is a little bit of lag from time to time and it might be, make us sound a little bit stupid because of that, but uh, apologies for that. I still think that this is a really good episode, so I wanted to leave it in, but uh, just bear with me that the audio does lag a little bit from time to time. That being said, let's get into this episode. If you want to check out the show notes, go to almckay.com slash 167 and let's dive in. Again, thanks for taking the time to chat and um, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yes, okay. Well, my name's Rory McGregor. I'm the CEO of Perspective and we make CineSync uh, and Frankie. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And just for anyone who's living under a rock in the uh, visual effects industry, do you want to give a brief overview of what CineSync is? And Frankie, if you want to dive into that as well. Sure. Uh, so CineSync is a remote review and approval application. Uh, it's for uh, reviewing video um, over the internet uh, in as many locations as you like. Uh, it's real-time interactive. Um, you can play, draw, um, make notes on the video, and everyone in that session can see exactly what you're doing. So it was really developed to help um, in the early days for visual effects um, productions mm -hmm. uh, to be able to review work from anywhere in the world because it's so distributed these days. Um, they needed a way of being able to see what everyone else is doing and make comments on it um, uh, without having to wait for emails to come back. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's live and interactive. No, it's really awesome. And yeah, I think I was watching one of your customer videos and someone mentioned that 
you know, it is kind of like Googling these days. You use it so commonly, and it is exactly like that. I mean, everyone's like, yeah, we'll do a CineSync session in a minute, and, you know, everyone knows what that is. But um, mm. I was kind of curious, like, what's the history behind it? And, you know, do you want to kind of dive into a little bit of the early days? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I guess um, there's two parts of that. The first bit was that I, I myself, I started in, um, in sound, in post-production in film uh, in, here in South Australia. Uh, and I had a bunch of friends who are working in visual effects uh, and uh, some classmates who are working at a company here called Rising Sun Pictures. Um, and I was looking for a change and they had just built this, um, uh, I guess, test software um, because they were working on um, uh, Harry Potter and Superman Returns uh, at the same time. And they were trying to review video with people in the US. They were trying to review stuff with people in the UK. Uh, and, you know, they're sending each other quick times, uh, trying to line them up at both ends and go, three, two, one, play. <laughs> um, and then realise they weren't watching the same the same cut, they weren't watching the same clip. It was just mm. a total mess. And like, there's got to be a better way to do this. So literally, um, a couple of guys sat down over a weekend and they mashed together a chat room and quick time. Uh, and they made this extremely dodgy um, synchronised video player. Um, and it allowed them to literally hit play at one end and it would play at the other end. So at the very least, they knew that they were looking at the same thing. Um, and so once they'd done that, uh, they were talking to me about it. I got excited about it. I started using it at, at um, where I was at the time. And soon after that, I came in to help um, commercialize it and actually turn it into a, uh, a, a product, mm. um, which required completely rebuilding it. I think, you know, we, we got a, it was one of those things. It was working over a weekend, but it took another two years to really uh, make it a product that was... Um, solid and, um, you know, a, an actual platform that was scalable. Um, but I think that was 2015. Um, and by the end of 2015, um, because it's a, a collaborative software, um, you're always using it with someone else. Um, Industrial Light and Magic had it. And so they started using it. And uh, I think Steven Spielberg was using it on War of the Worlds before it was even um, released. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even know he was using it. We, we found out um, when it came out in the press. So it was kind of amazing. It just, it took off. It, it was for an internal tool that was used to uh, solve, to, you know, um, built to solve a problem um, for one show. It just took off through the industry because it was so user friendly. I think we just, in a sense, we, we lucked into a, um, uh, an approach that really worked. No, that's awesome. And you said 2015, just to confirm, it was 2005, right? I, I do this all the time, so I, I just want to check. That is true. Yes. No, I completely got that wrong. Yes, 2005. It's been 13 years. I, I do it all the time. So, uh, yeah, yes. no, no worries. I, I think I actually met you guys. I can't remember who specifically, but um, uh, during like, a digital media festival one year, one, a few of the Autodesk guys were like, oh, you got to check out this tool. It's still in beta. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and just, just even hearing, you know, uh, just the description of it is just like, holy shit, that makes so much sense. And I think it was like... Mm. 06, I ended up back in Australia. I'm originally from there, by the way, in case my accent's that right. destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think it's 2006, we're shooting Superman Returns down there. RSP was on that. And um, yeah, there's, there's actually a couple of meetings that I've had with like Canada and LA from Australia, which yep. completely, you know, that all the problems that you're describing happen all the time where you'd be getting notes on something for a week where, when people are coming back, like, why are you still giving us, you know, different feedback to what I'm requesting? And then you you realize like what they're looking at is like a week old dailies, you know, that, that no, you know, you're communicating about the completely wrong shots and just all these little mm. things when you multiply it by huge production teams. I mean, the amount of time you can lose in a day is like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah, it's such a critical thing to have that, you know, I'm surprised was so overlooked. Yeah. Well, I think people had tried to build things, uh, in the past and there, there were a couple of other tools around at the time. Um, but, they either required you to have a completely mirrored file system at both ends, mm -hmm. um, or they, they required um, uh, they were trying to run it with timecode at both ends. So that, right. um, if there was any break in the internet at all, it would it would fall over. So they were they were in a sense they were over engineered systems. Um, and the the advantage that CineSync had was that it was really light. It was it was it didn't re require any specific bandwidth. It didn't require any specific machine to run on. <clears throat> it didn't require a specific file system to to make it work. You just had to have the file at both ends. Um, at least a dial-up connection um, and someone who could hit play. And that was basically it. Uh, and I think that that, um, it, I think it took a couple of years, but pretty much all the other 
um, solutions, most of which have been also built in-house by other visual effects facilities, uh, they, they fell away and, and CineSync became the, the default option. Yeah, I, I think that like one of the, like if you look at Shotgun and a lot of other tools, like typically I think you need to get to a certain bandwidth of, of people like scale-wise to, to really take advantage mm. of it. Whereas like I've worked on productions where we have a thousand people, uh, like ILM, obviously it's, it's you know, how we communicate with directors. Um, but then, you know, at the same time, like I've worked on feature films where I'm, I'm calling in from home, just using my laptop. And again, like it's, it's one of those tools that no matter what scale you're at, it, it becomes a pivotal part of your workflow. And, um, again, you know, when it comes to time and time and man hours become expensive, like, uh, keeping everything on, on track is such a critical thing for you. Um, yes. what do you find? Like, uh, you know, I feel like, again, it's such a, a critical or standard part of the industry, but like, um, what are some of your biggest clients that you you find that are using it for production? Uh, well, honestly, these days there are very few people who aren't using it. I know um, it's, it's such a trivial like, question because it's like, oh, well, we can list the ones who aren't using it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, it, it by far our biggest uh, market segment is visual effects. Um, so it's the the big VFX films. The the I mean anything that's made by Disney these days, the the Marvels, the Pixar's, um, the uh, um, you know, industrial light and magic. Um, we, all the major studios who, particularly the big VFX handful films, anything that's going out to multiple vendors, um, the vendors will have CineSync, the production will have CineSync, um, the studio will often have their own account. Um, so anyone can start a session at any time. It's just, it's sort of one of those things. We've we've had visual effects um, um, producers say to us that it's just one of the, the basic tools that they have in their kit when they first start up. So from the beginning of the bidding process, they'll have CineSync in there just as a thing in the background so that they have always have access to it at any time. If they've got a question about media or if they want to show someone something or if they want to demonstrate something, they can just do it. Um, because without it, you, you are literally, you're back to sending email attachments or mm -hmm. um, you know trying to do things, screen share through Skype, which can all work, but uh, it's clumsy compared to having that real-time interaction. Absolutely. And capturing all your notes as well. I guess like a lot of producers could say yeah. you got you got Excel and, and Cinesync and, and that's like the, the, the start of their toolkit. Yes. Um, that's cool. And I, I guess like... Um, yes, yes, indeed. And, go ahead. You know, I mean, also, I mean, you mentioned Shotgun before. Shotgun's been a really uh, important part of our um, uh, of our growth as well because capturing the notes um, is, as you said, a very important part of it. Uh, and we actually grew up alongside Shotgun. Um, uh, Rising Sun Pictures, I think, was pretty much the first visual effects company to invest in Shotgun or to mm -hmm. uh, to, to start testing it out. Uh, they were their first client. So uh, we kind of grew up alongside those guys. They started around the same time. Um, and the ability to be able to uh, have all of your notes and, and comments in Shotgun and be able to push it out to a live review in CineSync and then capture that and push it all back again um, has been really uh, important. It's been. I think it's also part of the reason that CineSync's been um, had that continued success is the mm -hmm. fact that it ties in with those other tools. And and these days, uh, F-Track um, is also providing that service, and we tie in with them. That's great. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I think the whole approach we've had from the beginning is making it as simple as possible, but making sure we're not, we've never been a competitive company. We never try and block anyone else out or try and make our tool exclusive. We want to make it work with everything else and make it as easy as possible to move between the different tools you're using. Um, and even the platforms like Shotgun, you know, they've got their, they've got their own integrated review systems within it. Um, we've worked along with them from the beginning to make sure that our bit works as well as it can um, and that their customers are as happy using our stuff and vice versa. That's great. As, as can be possible. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. I Rising Sun Pictures, actually, I did a episode with them back in episode 33, I think. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny looking at Australia. I think most people aren't really aware of like how much of an impact I think Australia has had, especially software side with so many of the visual effects tools that are standard today, like whether it's Flame or uh, a lot of the tools that have kind of grown up over the years. So um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's well, great. Even, even, even back further than that, um, uh, Australia uh, invented Wi-Fi. I didn't know that. Wow. Um, Australia, the, the CSIRO here in Australia um, has has the patent um, for Wi-Fi, and, and they they um, they won a big court case a few years ago to prove that they that they did have it. Um, so they've been getting royalties ever since. Should have worked for Tesla on his case as well. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, that's really cool. And like, just curious, like, um, I'm sure you've got hundreds of these, but uh, if if any kind of memorable success stories come to mind, like, I think with tools like this, it's 
it's more always like one of those like this is where it saved everyone's ass um, kind of situations. But is there any like big success mm. stories that other productions have had that CineSync kind of was a pivotal part of? Well, there's there's a there's a fun one. Not not necessarily a pivotal part, but uh, we were there when it happened. Um, there's a, a few years ago, uh, John Favreau uh, was talking to MTV about Iron Man Two, and they asked him about um, Captain America's Shield because Captain America's Shield uh, was in the first film. It was like a, a little um, uh, Easter egg. Mm -hmm. um, it was hidden in, in Tony Stark's studio, and they were asking about it. And he said, well, it's one of those funny things. It was not intended. It was actually put in um, by an, an, an artist at Industrial Light and Magic. He put it into them uh, as, a, as a joke for one of their CineSync sessions, mm -hmm. um, just for an internal review. And John Favreau thought it was so funny that it was there. He's like, well, let's leave it in and see if anyone notices. Uh, and of course, everyone noticed. So then, the second film, they had to work out how they were actually going to tie this um, this uh, character into Iron Man, which was never intended. Hmm. So, in a sense, the very first crossover of the of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was as a result of a joke, an internal joke in a Cinesync session, um, <laughs> which ended up being adopted as as their as their approach going forward. Now, I mean, they may well have had plans to expand it out, and I'm sure they did, but that was the first time it actually happened, um, and. Uh, yeah, that's kind of amazing. And I remember at the time, you know, when, when he started talking about it, it, it started making those lists of, you know, the top 10 most paused moments in films, you know, basic instinct and whatever. And this was one of them. Mm -hmm. And Sydney and used to always get a mention in that, which I just thought was hilarious. That's so cool. No, I love that. Um, yeah, I was actually, um, I, w I wasn't on Iron Man 2, but I was there while we were doing Iron Man 2 at ILM. And yeah, it's just kind of interesting to see that production kind of come together. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's so mm. cool. And yeah, I guess um, at the same time, like, you know, again, going back to the one or two people living under a rock, but like, what are some of the critical features that you guys have evolved over time? I'm assuming you guys have a pretty close relationship with your customers and um, knowing, mm. you know, because I think that uh, the biggest downfall of a lot of software companies is usually if they're the ones kind of making up what the, the end user should come up with, but the ones who are really, you know, leading uh, the race are the ones that are kind of listening to what everyone needs. And I'm, I'm assuming that that's a critical part of your process. Uh, look, absolutely. Um, we've, we've always been very driven. I mean, our whole interest in doing this has been about making things better for people. Uh, and so we're very driven to listening to our customers and making sure that we have what they want. Um, and it, it's funny because depending on who you talk to in the industry, they're very different things. You know, mm -hmm. um, artists want accessibility and ease of use. The studios want security. Um, you know, the the it's the, there's often quite um, competing um, requests we have. Uh, but I think primarily most of our um, most of our front end is driven by the visual effects supervisors, um, mm -hmm. and particularly in the last couple of years, it's been it's been the Marvel guys. Um, it's been people like Jake Morrison who looked after Thor two and and uh, the first Ant Man, um, Stefan Ceretti, um, and uh, you know people like that who just they are using this every day. They're using it with I think Jake said on Thor he had eighteen facilities who were using it, and he was in the CineSync session from the morning till the night every single day. Yeah. Um, just reviewing everything because he would, they were they were spread right across the world. Uh, he's based in in Los Angeles, and uh, it just becomes his. He's got this kind of central war room <clears throat> where he does everything out of, and then they've got a screening room next door where they'll run through everything in there and they'll do that um, internally, and then he'll go back to his war room and he'll just keep um, plugging away with all the different facilities. And <clears throat> so, and uh, sorry, just <clears throat> that's fine. Um, Taika uh, Watiti, uh, the director, yep. he's an artist as well. Um, in fact, he's a, he can do anything, but uh, he's an artist. So he would draw a lot of what he wanted um, in Sydney Sync sessions, and then Jake would take that and take, send that back to facilities and say, this is what you want to do. Um, so, But because he was using it so heavily and because he had um, people like Taika who weren't technical but were you know using it for artwork... Um, he had a lot of very specific requests about things that he wanted to do. And they, I mean, some of them were quite um, specific to what he needed around aspect ratios and those kind of things. But he also had um, a lot of very, um, in retrospect, obvious um, UI 
you know, little tweaks that just made it easier for someone who was using it all the time to be able to get through with shortcuts with, um, you know, the way you access different things. And um, so I think that kind of feedback has been fantastic because, you know, we do get feedback from people from time to time saying, oh, it'd be great if it did this. But <clears throat> for someone who says, I need this very specific thing for this very specific reason, and they can show it to you and, and, and it makes sense, um, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Because it means that we know exactly what we need to do. They get something at the end of it that's exactly what they want. And um, it's, a, it's a really um, satisfying feedback loop. Yeah, no, absolutely. And do you want to talk a moment for about um, security? Because like obviously that's all with the MPAA and Disney, everyone else. Like that's always been um, a big factor when you are communicating over the internet. Um, you know, for you guys, yes. like has that been a pretty major focus? Um, yes. So it has been focused for CineSync from the beginning, um, and in a sense, from its from its conception, um, CineSync was one of those things that just sort of sailed by the MPAA because we don't ever access the media. Um, CineSync is designed to have the media at, at both ends of a conversation or at multiple ends of a conversation. Um, and our servers sit in the middle of that and control the synchronization between the files. But the files themselves are transferred by the facility. They're not transferred through us. Um, it's not transferred through a third party or unless, not one that they don't know about. Um, so during a review, all that's being sent back and forth is control information. So it's saying, you know, play, stop, go to frame 67, um, draw a circle that starts here, it ends here. Um, we don't have any information about the media uh, at all. We, and no one from a CineSync session can access the media if they don't have it already. Right. So it's, it's kind of secure by design in that sense. But as the productions have um, had more and more media to move. They're doing more and more reviews. The, you know, I think these days, you know, it's quite common for films to have 1,500, 2,000 visual effects shots, um, and they need to be able to move this stuff around easily. We've had to find ways to maintain that paradigm, but allow facilities to access things more simply. So that means things like tying into Shotgun mm -hmm. uh, or F track. And if they're using cloud-hosted media, which um, you know is allowable in, in certain situations, that we can we can tie into that. Um, and if they're uh, using media that's entirely behind a firewall, um, that we are able to still communicate um, with our CineSync servers through that firewall, but all the media stays locked down um, and is air gapped from the internet and and never has access to the outside world. <clears throat> so we. Um, we're, we're constantly building systems to make it, uh, again, easy to get to the media, easy to, to post all the, the uh, information back to their um, project management systems, but never exposing the files to, <clears throat> to any um, party that's outside of um, mm -hmm. the production bubble. And um, so, yeah, so we've, we've had a couple of audits over the last few years um, from uh, people like Disney and, and uh, HBO and, and wherever else. And it's always passed with flying colors because of that um because of that separation because of the fact that we're not hosting files there's no way of losing them um as part of a CineSync review so yeah it's it's great because i mean it, it, it also helps us sleep at night because we know that we we're not going to be responsible for leaking anything either <laughs> yeah. um and and it's a very it's a very quick and easy discussion with the um uh people at facilities um, you know we need to sit down with security guys because as soon as we they know that um how it works um, it just makes sense to them and it's very, um, it's very safe. That's great. That's really cool. And obviously the industry, especially the last 10 years has, has grown dramatically, especially more globalized, obviously Melbourne and Sydney uh, mm. are getting a lot more studios. Um, uh, Montreal and, and Vancouver are, are the heart of it all now. And, um, yeah, have you found yep. that in, in a lot of ways, like obviously you're going to have your finger on the pulse with, with all of that, but I'm sure that that's become like the, the glue for a lot of these studios to be able to do what they're doing, especially when they are international. Yeah. I, I, I mean, without being ridiculous about it, I think that tools like you think, um, have really allowed studios to be able to do um, what they've done or the facilities to be able to do what they've done. And they, the whole way to make a facility be able to work, you know, in multiple locations at the same time, um, is is effective communication is being able to share files and uh, 
have clear communication about them. And we're not the only part of that, but we're an important part of it. And um, we also have found that in addition to facilities who have multiple of their own offices, we also have a lot of facilities who subcontract out to um, facilities in other countries. Um, and the great thing about CineSync is that it is, uh, because it's a visual tool, it can often bypass a lot of the um, confusion around um, you know, uh, language issues or mm -hmm. uh, cultural issues. Um, if you send an email to someone in China, um, you may not always have clarity around um, what it is that they expect, um, what is it you expect. Um, you know, you can use a, a phrase that you think is perfectly reasonable, but, um, you know, That's might tops. mean something else to someone else uh, yeah. in a second language. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, it, but if you can show it to them uh, in front of them and, and discuss it with them as you're doing it um, and answer questions as you go, then it removes all that potential for miscommunication and misinterpretation. And I think that's made it uh, a lot simpler. And as a result, we're seeing a lot of growth in countries like China. Um, both both companies who are working with uh, American, you know, Hollywood studios, but also um, internally within within the country, um, and that's that's going to be a big push for us um, over the next um, few years. So, uh, yeah, and then you know, just through um, through Europe has been a big um, they've been big users of ours for quite a long time, um, and we're seeing growth everywhere in the world and not just in film now and not just in visual effects uh, i think we've talked about this for a little while now but um you know what we used to consider to be visual effects and what we used to consider to be post-production is now just production mm -hmm. um there are people who are using it through pre uh there are people who are using it you know way way earlier before the, they've even rolled a camera um they're using it in television um, because television is no longer just TV. You know, there, there are visual effects shots in everything that they're doing, um, just from digital grading right through to um, set replacements and, and everything else. Um, and even, you know, shows that you don't think of as being big visual effects shows like um, uh, Madam Secretary in the US. Mm. Um, you know, they use anything constantly because they're, you know, they, you can't shoot that in Washington, so you have to replace all your backgrounds all the time. Yeah. And... Um, and it's really fast turnaround. You don't have a lot of options. So you need to be able to make a, uh, a communication quickly and simply make sure that everyone knows exactly what you need. So the next day when that shot's due, um, it's what you asked for. That's great. And so I think, yeah, I think that's where, where, where we're seeing our growth. It's, it's the fact that it's expanding into television. It's expanding into um, uh, uh, animation, game cinematics, that there, there are more and more countries who are getting involved in this. Um, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of debate around um, tax incentives uh, drawing work to various parts of the world, and I completely understand why that's upset some people, but for us it's great mm. uh, because it means that it, there's, there's always a new territory that's, that's, um, that needs our services. And, um, yeah, it's, it's for a tool that was created to solve a specific problem at a specific time it's amazing that it has uh, had the longevity that it's had that it's been 13 years now um, and this core of the product has remained largely unchanged over that time um, it's just been really adding features and 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 continuing to to remain integrated with the uh, with the rest of the industry but um, um, yeah the product itself is is still the cine sync it was the day it was born that's really cool. And yeah, I mean, you know, I think that the whole globalization for me, like, I, I think that it's kind of cool because I've been in LA for about 15 years now, I guess, CineSync started and I bailed from Australia. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. I, I do think that for me kind of witnessing it, I think it's just more like the rest of the world gets a chance to do what you had to originally be in the New York or LA bubble or London bubble to um, to originally do. So uh, if anything, the rest of the world yeah. gets a chance to, to actually get access to this sort of stuff, which is great. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And I, I think that that's also given rise to, we've seen a lot more of these sort of virtual studios um, mm. where rather than having a, a bricks and mortar facility, um, there are now um, studios, uh, VFX Legion in, in LA is a great example, where you've got a head office of, you know, three or four people, but all the artists um, are spread all over the world. And, you know, you can have, there's, there's a guy, I, I know VFX Legion have a guy who works from a, 
essentially a beach house in Thailand. Um, and he's getting paid American rates, but he's working, um, uh, you know, in a very cheap economy. So he looks like a king. Yeah, um, I want to cash in on that. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, it, there's, there's more and more people who are doing it. And, and it means that they can either work from home, uh, even in Los Angeles, you know, just trying to get across traffic. If you're on the wrong side of the valley and you need to get somewhere else, it can take a long time to get around. But if you can yep. do it from home and if you have the tools to do it from home, which now you do, um, then it's, it's really freeing up, up a lot of people. And it's starting to take some pressure off, not enough, but it started to take some pressure off that whole um, having to kind of move constantly to chase the work. Um, because you know, once people have families and they have kids in school, it can start getting really hard to to be chasing around the world and you know working in New Zealand for six months and then Sydney and then London and, and wherever. So if you have tools that allow you to um, to engage with productions and to go engage with visual effects facilities without having to physically be in that location, then I think that's a brilliant thing. That's uh, great. And and the more that that can be allowed, I think you know the, the better off the industry will be. That's awesome. And a couple more questions, but um, do you, uh, you might already have it, but like uh, in terms of mobile solutions, have you guys been looking into that as well? Obviously, a lot of people are probably about 60% mobile these days. So is that also a solution right now? Or is it one that you've held off just because of the more traditional way of using a Wacom and everything else to draw on screen at least? Uh, so yes, yeah, so we do have a, we do, we do have a CineSync app. Um, and we do have customers who use uh, CineSync uh, on their phone or on their iPad. Um, and often we find people actually are, are as much likely to use it as a, um, almost as a remote control in a screening theatre. Um, and they're like, you know, doodling around with the, uh, with the iPad to make that work. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of customers who say they use it on the train, who, who use it um, as they're travelling between meetings. Once they get to a meeting, they prefer to use the, the hardware um, you know, a computer-based mm-hmm. version of CineSync because the biggest issue with mobile is just the data size, the, the files that you're moving around. The amount of um, material that you have to review um, is going to, um, you know, fill your phone pretty quickly. Yeah. So we've we've made a bunch of um, changes around the way that we send files to, to mobile devices. Um, you know, at the end of a review, a review, they're cleaned off again. We don't leave files lying behind. So... Uh, um, it means that we, we try and uh, leave as much room on people's uh, devices as, as we can. But, uh, yeah, we still give people the option because, as you said, yeah, mobile is a, is a really important part. And particularly, again, in places like China where they live on their phones, um, it's, a, it's a fundamental way of being able to um, tap into people's desire to be connected um, via whatever device they have. That's great. Cool. And um, yeah, I already read somewhere your answer to this, but I figured it'd be one with the touch on anyway, because it's kind of interesting. And that's yeah. um, obviously some people are kind of moving more into the VR space and um, looking at, you know, doing VR meetings, things like that. Um, just in general, like, is that something that you guys have? Um, well, I'll, I'll make it a double ended question, but um, have you guys looked into the whole VR yeah. platform as one that you'd entertain? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we've, we've actually built um, a, a VR player in CineSync, um, not a, a released version, but we've built a, a VR, or I guess more accurately, a 360 video player mm-hmm. that's fully interactive. Um, and we're looking at, at VR workflows. I think you know reviewing in VR is one of those tricky things where it sounds like a great idea, but mm-hmm. in practice um, can be quite uh, disconcerting. Um, you know, if, if you force someone's viewpoint to follow someone else's viewpoint while you're in a VR helmet or goggles, it, uh, it, you can make someone's, um, yeah, bring a bucket with you. <laughs> you know, hit, hit, you can make someone's head explode. Uh, but the ability to have someone looking around with goggles and someone else looking at it on a monitor, um, so at least they can see what the person's seeing when they're saying, you know, this doesn't look right or this doesn't move correctly or uh, I need this changed. Um, yeah, there's at least a way of being able to do that. And there are some tools. I think I've seen a couple of review tools already that are, that are doing this as well. So um, we, we have that. We're looking at rolling that out fairly soon. Um, I rem- myself remain slightly unconvinced that VR is a, uh, an ongoing um, uh, platform that will see success. I think that, there, that there's something there, but I'm not sure that it's, that people have quite yet found the proper application for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously people are very excited about it. So, um, you know, we, we need to be uh, involved in it. That's cool. um, 
but I, I yeah, I think um, uh, AR is going to be enormous. Uh, it's going to outstrip VR substantially. And we obviously probably have a little less to do with that side of things. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in, interested to see where that goes. Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree. I think the VR in a way, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's the intermediate technology. It's going to be a stepping stone that people get on board with that and start mm, yes. migrate into, yeah, MR and v, in AR as well. Um, that's really cool. And yep. yeah, I guess just for, you know, to kind of wrap things up, but like, um, are there any big features announcements or things like that that are kind of on, you know, in terms of the trajectory of, of Cinesync in the next couple of months or? Uh, to be honest, I don't think there are going to be any massive announcements over the next little while. Uh, we are continuing to build out the tools that we have. Uh, we, uh, as I said, VR is something that we're working on um, and something we're likely to have out soon. Um, we've done some work recently, um, you know, over the last year or so, we've added the ability to, to play frame sequences, to, um, to have like uh, mini edits uh, and to compose those within CineSync. Um, you know, we are continuing to build out our tool set with, uh, with F-Track um, and Amish Shotgun. Um, we're continuing to integrate with various different tools. Uh, we, we added uh, NIM, who's another platform um, out of LA, who are excellent. Um, so yeah, it's really just, we're just at the moment staying the course. It's a, it's a really mature software. I think people know how it works. Um, we're always wary of changing things too much. Uh, mm -hmm. people don't like change. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think, you know, at the moment it's just, uh, it's just servicing our customers as best we can and making sure that it does what they need. That's really awesome. And yeah, where can people go to find out more about CineSync and Frankie? All right, so yes, uh, cospective.com, www.cospective.com. Um, CineSync's on there and Frankie, um, Frankie being essentially the web-based version of, of CineSync, um, which uh, is used by advertising companies and people who ha have um, very low, um, they, they, they maybe they have customers who have very low technical um, ability but need to be able to review files uh, quickly and easily. Um, Frankie is the, just the simplest way of being able to review things, where CineSync um, is more of the heavy lifting. It allows you to play bigger files. Um, it's 100% it's secure. Um, and, yeah, and it gives people the choice of, of how they want to be able to access things and, and what the tools they want to use. Cool. This has been really great, man. I want to thank you for taking the time to chat. It's been really fun. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. Cool, I appreciate it. Okay, I want to thank Rory for taking the time to chat. This was a lot of fun. There was a little bit of lag in this call, and so I think that kind of caused a few communication issues. So apologies for that, but I still wanted to publish this because I did think it uh, had a lot of relevance and a lot of fun to dive into. Um, so that being said, I'll be back next episode. In the meantime, if you want to check out the show notes, go to alanmckay.com slash 167. Finally, if you find this episode or other episodes from the podcast helpful, useful, enjoyable, then if you can take a moment to go on iTunes and leave a review and also subscribe if you're not already, that would mean the world to me, as well as share this episode on your social media. Again, this is something that I do completely non-profit. And if anything, I spend tens of thousands, if not twenties of thousands of dollars um, every year putting these together. So take a moment if you can to share this around and also leave a review and rate the episode or the podcast, I should say. That would mean the world to me. That being said, I'll be back next episode. Rock on.